I'm excited to welcome the panelists. I, I am actually going to bring all the panelists first on stage and I'm gonna very quickly uh, introduce them. As they come up, uh, this is a panel I'm really excited about. And the reason for that is it's a topic, that especially the generational change in VC, it's a topic that I've never seen any panel sort of discuss or go deep. And the reason for that is either because any generational change might take not days or weeks, normally it's years. So that's sort of one side of it. And then the second side is sometimes when we hear about it, uh, actually something normally that has gone bad in the fund and then we read it on uh, TechCrunch or the information or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. So it's it's almost often like a, whether people are not ready to talk about it or they don't feel they're ready to talk about it or when it's talked about, normally it's bad news. So we're really excited to have the today's panelists here. And it is a really great mix between uh, we're talking about like passing the torch, right? So to be interesting, you want to have people who are receiving the torch, and then you also want to have people thinking about like who they're gonna pass the torch to so that it has the sort of both side of the table. Sometimes talk about both sides of the table between investors and founders. In this case, we're talking about like one generation of the GPs to the leadership for the next uh, generation. So I'm gonna do a quick intro of each of the panelists and I'm gonna follow the order of first name. So I'll start with Alex, uh, Alex Rosen. It's a co-founder at Rich Ventures. He has been early stage investors and invested in over 50 uh, founding teams. But when you look at the aggregate of how much value was created, it was uh, over 11 billion with over 20 exits. So it's a really impressive track record, and you've been in the industry uh, for some time now. <laughs> and it's sort of quite impressive. You've also seen like several funds and several uh, generations. Although he doesn't look that old. I, I did not mean to date you. <laughs> I, just, I think that was a compliment. I'm not sure. Like it's a compliment. He's, he's lucky I'm here to cover. <laughs> um, so a bit of the track record. It's uh, you invested in my assignment that was acquired by uh, CBSI, Crux, acquired by Salesforce, and uh, uh, MindMeld, acquired by Cisco. And it's a pretty impressive uh, list of uh, startups that I invested. But I think when we look at your sort of career path, you start as, as an associate uh, at uh, General Atlantic, and then later on became uh, in another fund called Sprout Group that we're gonna dive a little bit deeper where you raised several funds and it was uh, the funds eventually sort of no longer exist under uh, that name. So uh, currently you're building your new fund, right, under Ridge. I know it's been like few generation now, few funds uh, that it used to call IDG. So it's gonna be really interesting to see what you've seen in the past and then also a little bit forward looking as uh, you are in this sort of new endeavor. Uh, then uh, moving to Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl is a general partner at uh, Blue Run Venture, early stage venture fund focused in mobile and also uh, service investments. And you started as an operator, uh, very active in marketing, branding, retail, M&A, and then eventually got pulled in to become a general partner and sort of now being uh, past the torch. Again, your investment include Hello Hard, uh, sent with us, Zimi, and I know you're also active with the, the Stanford uh, Biodesign Program, the L'Oreal Women in Digital Program, and the board member of Stanford Ronald McDonald House. So it'll be really interesting to see your experience starting first as an operator, now investor, and with Blue Run, now it's been a few cycles too, so to hear uh, your experience uh, there. And then uh, Paul, uh, Paul is with uh, Foundation Capital, and what you do really well, it's uh, to scale company from zero to 100 million, but also in terms of value, market capitalization is over 13 billion, several companies that went public, and then with acquisition, uh, like strong acquisition there. And it will be also interesting because you join uh, Foundation Capital not as part of the founding team, but definitely now you're in the leadership role. So we're uh, really excited to hear how this sort of, what came to the past and then how we move that uh, to the future. 
So I'll start with the first question. Since we have both sides of the table of like receiving the baton and then also passing it, tell us a little bit about your experience and also how does it feel? Any order. Okay. Um, so hi everybody. So how does it how does it feel? feel? Um, how it is feels, it and how does it feel? It feels heavy. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility. No, so I, I, I think it would be helpful to give a little bit of background. So Blue Run Ventures, um, we used to invest globally out of one fund. And so I think we've gone through sort of two transitions over the last 10 years. The first one was that we actually had general partners in China and in Korea. And one transition was to actually split the firm into separate entities. And so that actually is a transition that I didn't know I was going to go through um, when I interviewed <laughs> and joined BRV, um, but I was part of that. And we had, um, it took a lot of time, actually, to be honest. We, we decided that we wanted to do it, but we set metrics for ourselves as a team in terms of when, we'd be, when we would be ready to make that transition. And for us, that was when each geography had at least $1 billion exit. We felt that those local teams would be ready to have sort of their own platform, um, management company, investment committee, et cetera. So I watched our firm go through that, um, which was very interesting. Um, it has a lot of qualitative stresses on the organization, and I saw my partners go through that when I was an operating partner. And then now, from a US team perspective, we're thinking a lot about what does succession planning look like. Um, and it's not really about the fact that people are just going to retire and go away. It's more around the culture that we want to continue within the firm. And so when we think about succession planning, and when I think about it, I really think about how do we set up a culture that makes all the new people that we bring in successful to be venture leaders for the future. Um, so I feel like I'm sort of in between because I'm responsible for shepherding a lot of that transition for our firm in the next kind of five to 10 years. Thank you. So as Cheryl said, transitions can take place, uh, can look like um, more than just generational transition. So I wanted to give sort of a little bit of background on my experience. So I started in venture capital almost as long ago as you suggested. Um, <laughs> At, at a firm called General Atlantic, which at that point had 11 investment professionals in one office. Today, it's over 100 people in eight countries, I believe. So I've seen how that firm had been able to scale and transition um, actually two different generations of leaders. Um, and then I spent eight years at a firm called Sprout Group, and given the way that Beji introduced it, like a firm, I think, called Sprout or something like that, I would assume most people in the room here don't know it. It was actually one of the first five or six venture firms in the business established in 1969, um, you know, three or four years before Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins were in business. So it was around for 35 years, raised 11 funds, and I watched it disintegrate. Um, that was not a good transition. So as I've now been at Ridge for 12 years, and I'm thinking about the next 20 years of our firm, I'm trying to incorporate the good lessons, the painful lessons, and how we think about the transition of our firm uh, going forward. So that's sort of my background. Uh, and my name is Paul Holland. I'm a general partner at Foundation Capital. Uh, Foundation was founded uh, 23 years ago. Um, and it's unusual today, and it was really unusual then, but we were founded by a woman, um, and her name was Catherine Gould, and Russ Hall's back there. He knows how extraordinary a woman it was. Among other things, she would have hated that I said it was founded by a woman. You just kind of have to know Catherine. That's just not how she thought about things. Uh, um, but sadly, she is, uh, she's passed away. And also, uh, my partners, Bill Elmore and Jim Anderson. Um, the firm had been part of a larger firm uh, called Merrill Pickard. That firm broke into two pieces back then in, in, in late 1995. Benchmark Capital and Foundation Capital emerged from that. I'd spent my operating career working for the Benchmark guys. So I worked with Andy Ratcliffe and Reed Hastings at a company called Pure Software, um, where I ran a bunch of the go-to-market and international 
and then I went uh, to work with Dave Byrne uh, at a company called Kana Communications um, with Mark Ganey and Michael Horvath, who've now, of course, gone on to do Strava. So I only had two jobs, kind of effectively, before I came in, and I was lucky. I got hooked up with two phenomenological entrepreneurs of their time, and uh, you know we created uh, about $12 billion in outcome from there. Uh, when I joined Foundation, uh, it was uh, 17 years ago yesterday. Uh, so it was three weeks after 9-11, and I recognize that means that you know, some of you were in uh, toddlers uh, at that time, or at least in elementary school. And um, at the time, I remember I went to a party with a couple of my contemporaries, uh, Scott Sandell and George Zachary, and they said, whatever you do, don't invest in anything. Because they just come off of 2000 and 2001 when it was absolutely horrible. And as much as I like those guys, it was the worst advice possible because I should have invested in everything. Um, I was looking at SaaS companies with $7 million run rates that were 13 post, um, just to give you a flavor for kind of what it was like in terms of bargain shopping back then. But in terms of foundation, um, we're now uh, on our eighth fund. Uh, we uh, um, have, uh, have largely raised our ninth fund. Um, and, uh, and I, the way I think about it is sort of in generations. We had sort of generation one, which was our founding team and a couple other folks. And that was when we had pretty small fund sizes and a pretty tight group, pretty cohesive, uh, virtually no turnover. Uh, those two funds ended up being about 11x each. Now some of that was timing, uh, 95 and 98. Some of that was some unbelievable selections with companies like Netflix and Net Zero and Commerce One and others. Uh, but some of that was a small, tight team working with a relatively small amount of dollars. We then went through Generation 2, that's where I started, um, and we got much bigger, uh, much more unwieldy. Our fund size is uh, 10x, so we got up to a $750 million fund. And not surprisingly, our, our, we were no longer sort of in the top of the top in terms of performance, uh, because it's just hard to do through that. And I have been you know, fortunate in that my third generation partners, Charles and Eshu and Steve, asked me to stay on to help kind of transition to where we are today, which is we're now sort of more fit and lean, $325 million fund. Um, and at the moment, we're being told by our investors that share us in common with other medium-sized funds that our current fund is absolutely the top fund in this vintage. And there's some really, really cool companies. If we get time, I'd love to talk about them. But um, that's kind of where we are today. Thank you. And uh, I know transition period feels long. It, it is long. How? What's the feeling sentiment? I think you mentioned it's heavy. Any sort of word that sort of comes to mind for Alex and Paul too? Like what a word that would come up? How does it feel when you go through the transition? So I think in our case, the transition was quite long. So in the case of Ridge, the firm started 20 years ago as a um, single LP fund called IDG Ventures. Then it would transition to a hybrid fund, which is when I got involved, uh, which was a second generation, still called IDG Ventures. IDG was the anchor LP. We raised money from outside, limited partners for that. And then we proceeded to spend the next eight years uh, having the first 10, meeting, 10 minutes of every meeting telling entrepreneurs what IDG is and how we're not a corporate fund. So that was a very long um, and painful couple of years uh, where we finally decided that by the time we're going to do our next fund, which would have been fund four, uh, we want to have a clean separation, a clear identity as to what we are, what we do, have a name that reflects that and not be connected to a corporate entity. So all in, it was probably a two and a half year process of buying URLs. Uh, trying to decide what your name should be. I'm sure Cheryl can relate to coming up with a new name, making sure that our strategy, which today is you know, pure early stage, pure enterprise, you know, relatively small check size, we're a $140 million fund, um, kind of actually aligns with what it is we know how to do, we can do that well, um, and then having LPs who align with that strategy as well, and then have the people around who, uh, who align with that. So all that, you know, long time. So talking about a uh, long time, there is a moment very often people make an announcement. So when you look at what uh, Fred Wilson did with Union Square Venture or Jim did at Sequoia uh, on the transition part, they decided to say, hey, we're still in business. We're not leaving the ULP or the partners behind, but we're passing officially the torch to the new generation. 
when is a good time? Is there such thing as a good time to announce, or is there a good time that you feel like transition is done? I think it's actually more important to focus internally in your house as opposed to externally making announcements. Um, this is just my opinion. Because I think that the announcement, by the time it comes, the transition is actually over. And there's so much work that needs to do to be done. Um, and it's really more about, about the people that are working for you and making sure that the people who work for you or work for the firm all feel like they have a home and a place and a mission. And that is so much more important than waving a flag and saying like, we're moving on to the next generation because in my opinion, like nobody really cares that much. Um, I think they care to know that there is a culture and a heartbeat at the firm that's going to continue and entrepreneurs who come through the door and meet any firm, any group of partners um, would see that. So I think it's more um, knowing when your team is ready, more so than making the announcement that it's happened or it's happening. I agree with that. I would also add that, at least from my perspective, I assume that I have no freaking clue what actually goes on behind closed doors of any other firm other than our own. So I tend not to pay attention what's written on blogs in TechCrunch because you can make anything sound amazing while in fact it was a you know politic you know a knife fight in the background, right? So. Uh, you, d you don't know what's going on. What I'll tell you is I think that to do it well, you need to have two things happen. First of all, it has to be a process. It's not a sort of five minutes of passing the torch here. Got it. Um, uh, and I think secondly, you have to be really explicit about what that means. And as at least sort of as I think about it, I think there are four elements of a transition that people generally don't talk about. Um, because it usually ends up being uncomfortable for somebody, right? And the four things are responsibility, so roles and responsibilities. What are the people doing sort of before and after? Um, it's economics, which really makes people uncomfortable because it's a generally fixed buy. Um, it's about power. Um, and then it's about attitude, and it's attitude both on the people who are receiving the torch and people who are passing the torch. And at least mentally, I call that REAP. Um, it's not exactly a trademark acronym, so don't Google it, please. Um, <laughs> but I think that as long as you actually have a conversation about, so what is your job? How much are you getting paid for that? What is the attitude of the people around you, and how much power do you have? There is no transition that has happened. And in order for that to do that effectively, you need to talk about it way ahead of time, and it's probably a full, uh, full fun cycle um, before you can actually do anything and do that effectively. I mean, I, as I thought about this panel, I think uh, these comments are, are terrific, because I thought about this panel, um, you know, I think the, you know, the, 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 the uncomfortableness part of it is, is a really big key. Um, you know, we've gone through, I think, very positive transitions with partners, and I feel like my transition that is, you know, is kind of uh, at the beginning now, uh, has been very respectful. Um, you know, I think if you're a younger partner in a firm, uh, just keep in mind you're talking about somebody's feelings, and even though they're going to go and kind of do something a little bit different, uh, it doesn't mean that they don't care what their spouses read and their children read and things like that about how that's going to happen. And it also means that they, you know, they. It's more importantly, like how do they feel? How do they feel about your interactions? Um, as I thought about what I've seen, not just at, you know, in terms of what we've dealt with, but I was president of the Western Association of Venture Capital for a while, and I've gotten to know a lot of firms, and I come up with a lot of Shakespearean kind of analogies, like, you know, Night of the Long Knives, and Et, <laughs> et tu Brute, and, uh, you know, um, because, because they're, they can be incredibly violent, uh, just, they can, they can tear firms apart, and, um, you know, talk to someone like Russ who, who evaluates firms all the time as a limited partner. It's one of the things that they're really looking for is just, you know, do you have the right people in the right jobs and there's a certain cohesiveness in the way things work. And so, you know, speaking only for myself, um, I've had a really positive experience with my partners. We've had um, all of our interactions have been face to face uh, with each other in the room. <laughs> Um, no side conversations, no anything else. Uh, we've actually formalized all my, the responsibilities, all the pieces that are there. 
Uh, and then they were kind enough uh, to do something that I think, if anything else, just kind of made me feel good, which is they asked me to stay on through the next fund uh, as an investor and to continue to work with the group, even though I don't have to be a general partner anymore, which for me translates into I don't have to go to all the meetings, which I'm absolutely thrilled with uh, after 17 years. So I think if you get can that get gig. to that, yeah, I know. If you can get to that, I'm really looking forward to it. I've still got another year and a half of full time to go. But um, the final part is the responsibility of the, of the person who's transitioning. Um, I've kind of seen this in person. Another Shakespearean reference here is Hamlet, you know, to be or not to be. And anyone who's been around a firm for a long time, it can be incredibly frustrating to, uh, to, to watch somebody kind of, well, am I going to do this? Am I not going to do it? Am I going to do it full time? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do, do that? If, to me, that's pretty unfair to the next generation. I think you kind of need to kind of make up your mind and come up with it. A firm I respect uh, tremendously, partly because I spent my whole operating career working for them, but partly because they've killed it, is Benchmark. And I think, um, you know, they do a very good job. You're either in or you're out. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we and others kind of got lost a little bit. And I think firms get lost a little bit with this notion of like, you know, is somebody in control? Are they have a full voting power? Do they have a fiduciary response? You know, there's all these different things. And I think the cleaner you can make it, the better. But since we went from like 10 partners at one point, now we have four. Uh, general partners, it's a hell of a lot easier because you're, you know, everything gets better. Decision making, all that stuff gets better. When you have a hydra that you're dealing with, it's really easy to make a lot of mistakes. And uh, you, since you were talking about play, I know you also co-produce uh, something venture. So you study a little bit of history, like the beginning of venture, and you look at sort of analogy or pattern recognition. Any sort of key thing you think that it's very important to do a successful like change in the the generational change so the the film something ventured uh, I made uh, and we debuted at South by Southwest in 2011 that was kind of a lucky accident um, but I made the film because I was having lunch with a guy named Bill Edwards uh, who since passed away um, and he was the original head of the Western Association of Venture Capital. At that time, it was called Western Associations of SBICs. I like to tease my friends and say that the venture business was started by the federal government with the small business investment to companies, but that's an aside. Um, and uh, he began to tell me stories about how Apple got funded and how Intel got funded and how the gaming industry began with, uh, with Nolan Bushnell and Atari and how Genentech started the biotechnology revolution. So I walked out of that lunch just just like fired up and thinking, well, I've got a buddy that does video. I'll get him to do like a little talking heads piece because these guys are old and you know they're going to die someday and I don't want to lose the history, as it were, which was a real motivation. And long story short, got a lot of encouragement. Uh, Jim Getz, Fred Wong, a bunch of other people said, dude, that's a really good idea. Like you should go really make something happen with this. So we raised a million dollars made the film, and we archived uh, nine of the originals um, uh, who started some of the iconic companies. Um, and, and so what some of the things I learned about that, it, it's, it's not that clean. Some of those guys uh, decided to transition you know, early and, and clean and so forth. Some of those guys stayed around for a long, long time. I mean, two of those guys continued to invest into their 80s, uh, full investors into their 80s in their funds. Uh, apparently with the enthusiasm of their partnership. So it's a little hard to kind of draw anything from that. But I would say that the industry, you know, it's really quite young. I mean, the whole industry is, you know, 50, 60 years old. And a lot of the practices that came together are pretty anecdotal. Um, one of the questions I know you're going to talk about, are there new models? Uh, I think that there are a bunch of exciting new models if we get to it. Uh, I really like what Signifier is doing. I like what some of the other folks are doing to create sort of more value-added institutions as opposed to just anecdotal collections of personalities. Uh, so I'm actually very excited about the future of venture. And then, thank you. And Cheryl, one thing that we were uh, having conversation, especially w you join um, it's an operator and then a junior team. And very often when you have your kids, your kids are always kids, right? Even when they're 30 or 40, uh, like when I call my parents, they're st I'm still a kid. So how do you get a seat, because you join that way, right? How do you get to sit at adults' table? Like, do you say, hey, 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 like, I'm here. Like, can I do this? Can I do that? Or is it something that you normally plan? And how you do it? So in full disclosure, when I joined BRV 10 years ago, my plan was to stay for a year, maybe two years. Um, at that time, you know, I was transitioning from consumer packaged goods, and and I wanted to reimmerse myself in technology. So I, I really didn't plan to 
stay as long as I did. So I did not have a plan to say, you know, me, me, me. Um, I also didn't actually have a plan to become an investor. Um, what I love is building companies and products. And so that's the background that I came from. And so that's what I wanted to do at BRV. And so the role that I had scoped out for myself initially was just to work across the portfolio um, in business development and marketing. And over a series of companies and years, um, the CEOs themselves became my champion. And when they talked about, you know, when they talked to my partners about, okay, well, what is the team gonna look like? Um, you know, what is Cheryl's role gonna be? They were advocating for me in a way that I, I hadn't really planned for myself. So bad career planning on my part. Um, so I think I, I got a little bit lucky. The question though around, you know, I, I did join um, relatively young and you know my partners, they're amazing, but they're definitely older than I am. And so um, do they see me always as a kid? Um, and sometimes they do, right? Um, they, they really do. And it is this really fine balance, I'll be honest, between you know, being able to you know, pound the table and say, no, like, you know, I get a vote. You know, you said I get a vote. Like, I'm exercising my vote. Um, and also making sure that I'm constantly learning. Because one of my biggest fears is, am I actually ready um, to receive the torch? And, and how do I know, right? And, and actually, the business of venture seems so incredibly complex. It's so much more than sourcing a cool entrepreneur. Um, and one of the things that I asked for over my transition period was, please give me more exposure to LPs. Please give me the opportunity to learn the business that is venture and not just this idea of you know, going to a lot of events and meeting as many entrepreneurs as possible. Um, so it's taken time, but it was, there is a little bit of that healthy tension, I think, between am I still always the kid or do I get the same vote? You don't have to ask us because we're not the kids. <laughs> no, but I think that you know what you're talking about is actually is really interesting, and I think that's probably the part that most firms fail at on both sides, right? The the younger generation kind of wants to pound the table and wants to drive forward. The older generation generally hangs on, you know, for too long, right? Those kind of the you know the truisms. On the other hand, you know, if you think about it, if you could have. Catherine Gould hanging out in your office a couple times a week giving you advice like I would give my left arm for that right so like it would be insane not to try to figure out a way to get the people who've seen five market cycles and 10 technology cycles and you know have made you know ridiculous returns for investors actually hanging around and helping you build a business so uh, the generational transition takes years sometimes a full fund cycle three years, five years, maybe. This panel is supposed to be 30 minutes, and apparently we're out of time. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. What I wanted to highlight, actually, it's been like, it's a really interesting sort of topic because now we see a new generation of new funds coming up. Very often you see also like spin off within the fund Maybe because it's because they set up a new investment thesis, they want to give opportunity to new fund managers. There's often rebranding because of the natural evolution of the industry. So it's really interesting to see and get a lot of it, uh, your experience, both on the side that have gone through some of those transition and seen it gone well, or like you recently that it's sort of taking the firm to, to the next sort of five, 10 years. So. In 10 years, when we come back, it will be very interesting to see how like, the model and also the VC world evolved. Thank you very much. And Paul and I will be in our wheelchairs. <laughs>